So welcome everyone to the Women in Leadership panel today. It's uh, a great honor to be here with all of these fabulous women and to have you all out there watching us. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Melanie Buttle and I am the principal of Peter Ozowski College and my personal research interests are women in business, historically speaking. So it's kind of uh, great for me to be here and, and uh, I'll be your host for today. Uh, I'm gonna give you um, a little brief outline of the events, a little housekeeping before we move into our, our discussion. So if you if you have questions uh, at the at the end of the panel discussion, we will have a little bit of time for some questions um, in our program, and that will be uh, at about 1130, 1140. So we'll make sure we have a little bit of time for some questions. Uh, the program includes uh, these lovely distinguished uh, women leaders in front of me, who I will introduce in a second. We're going to hear from each of them and our moderator, Lindsay Warren, who's also on the screen, will be uh, asking some questions of the panel. At the end of that, as I said, we'll have a little bit of Q&A and then we'll be uh, turning the program over to alumni um, engagement for a few minutes at the end. So that's kind of where we are and we should be wrapped up by, by 12 o'clock. Uh, so yeah, as I said, keep your questions to the end and there's a Q&A that, that you can enter them in. This meeting is, this webinar is being recorded uh, and you are not on screen if you're in the audience, so you should be good to go there. But if you have any concerns, you can email Career Space, which is on the screen, or us in the Q&A, uh, or talk to us afterwards about that. So I think uh, I will get us started. First, I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Michisagig Anishinaabe uh, here in, in Peterborough and the Corthas, which is where I am, and we all may be on different territory at this moment. We offer our gratitude to the First Nations for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations, and may we honor those teachings. Miigwech, thank you for that. And you may be in uh, a traditional territory that is different from ours, and I hope you are uh, able to look up your own land acknowledgements and awareness for that. So I'm going to introduce our panelists uh, briefly before we turn to some of the questions. So with us today, we have Dr. Katie Taylor. Katie is the chair of the board of the Royal Bank of Canada, the former president and chief executive officer of Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts, former chair of the Sick Kids Foundation, uh, trustee of the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, vice chair of the ADECO Group in Zurich and director of CPPIB and Air Canada. We are really honored to host Katie Taylor as the current CEO in residence with the School of Business at Trent University. She has an honorary degree from Trent that she received at the Durham campus, I believe in 2016. Uh, and Katie is also honorary chair of the Trent University Durham campaign. So thank you, Katie, for being here with us. I know you've brought a lot of uh, great enrichment to our students. Um, I'm going to introduce Rhonda next. Rhonda Barnett, 87 alumni, is the president and chief operating Chief Operating Officer at AVID or AVIT Manufacturing. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics from Trent University and Rhonda's passionate and relentless promotion of small to medium sized Canadian manufacturers has turned some heads and her recent appointment to the federal government's Industry Strategy Council is a testament to the widespread respect she has earned. Rhonda was chair of the National Board of the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters, CME, a historic appointment as the first female chair in 147 years. Uh, welcome, Rhonda. Thanks so much for being with us. That's great. Uh, Julie Davis is the Vice President of External Relations and Advancement at Trent University, where she is recognized for her inspiring and inclusive leadership. Julie has worked in the public, private, and charitable sectors, uh, and her roles have spanned local, national, and international environments. With a business degree and a master's in leadership, she has experience in marketing, communications, fundraising, and community development. Julie previously served as president and CEO of the Peterborough Regional Healthcare Foundation. And prior to that, she was a marketing executive with Quaker Oats Company of Canada and Unilever. Uh, and Ju uh, Julie has served on a variety of not-for-profit uh, and sector boards. So welcome, Julie, great to have you with us. Dr. Don Laval Harvard is the director of the First Peoples House of Learning at Trent University, a proud member of the Wigwemekong First Nation on Manitoulin Island, and the first Aboriginal Trudeau scholar. She works passionately to advance the rights of Aboriginal women. Dawn has served as president of the Ontario Native Women's Association since 2003, as vice president of the Native Women's Association of Canada, 
and Don was elected national president in 2015. Uh, welcome, Don. Great to have you with us as well. Um, I will just add that in the collegiate way at Trent University, Rhonda is a member of the Lady Eaton College of Lady Eaton College. Uh, Julie and Don are both fellows of Peter Zosky College. And Katie, I feel like you're sort of a fellow of Durham in a way, even though it's not a collegiate system. But we we think of you and and hope you uh, think of yourself as an honorary fellow as well, since we've got a very Zosky group here. Uh, and lastly, I just want to introduce Lindsay Warren, who is a fourth year psych and business student here at Trent University, a leader in her own right, uh, and will be helping moderate the discussion today. So welcome, Lindsay. Great. So I'm going to get us started off um, by turning to Katie first to answer a brief question. And I'll turn to each panelist before we go to some other questions from Lindsay. So this question is for all of you, but I'll start with you, Katie. What have been your strategies for success in your field and how would you describe your leadership style? Well, that's a great big, huge question, Melanie. First off, let me say thanks everyone for being with us. What a pleasure it is to be on a, on a, on a STEAM panel like this and have a chance to engage on such important issues. Uh, strategies for success for me, if you look at my career track and follow along the CV, you'll see that um, I didn't know I was doing this at the time, but, but I would say with the benefit of hindsight, um, take smart risks, right? Make, uh, make very calculated, thoughtful decisions about where to take your career next. Um, don't be afraid to take a step, particularly early in career. Um, very important um, in those early years to figure out what you love and what you're good at. Um, and in order to do that, you sometimes have to move yourself out of your comfort zone to, uh, to see where where uh, life is going to take you. I would say the other thing I, I did uh, strategically was always work to expand my scope. Um, lots of times people are, oh, if I could just get to the next level, oh, if I could just get the next promotion, oh, if I could just get the next title. My experience shows that if you take on scope, um, start to make larger contributions, get yourself noticed um, in your own department outside of it, um, the, rest, uh, the rest will follow. But sometimes at critical moments in your career, you have to ask for what you need. You have to be able to step forward and say, I want to contribute more. I want to be a, high, a more highly valued member of the team. I want to see where my career can progress um, with this organization. And those can be pivotal, pivotal moments in time. Uh, there was a moment when I was a young uh, senior vice president at Four Seasons and, and the, the uh, succession plan was proceeding and I had no knowledge of it. I was a junior person. I found out later after promotion had gone through uh, that one of my peers had been moved into the next level, um, contemplating his ultimate um, career progression through the ranks to take on for uh, over for a, a retirement that would be pending in a few years. And uh, he's a great guy. I wasn't offended by, by it, but I did wonder um, what happened to me. And so I asked my boss and he said, uh, well, we actually didn't talk about you. And I said, well, really? Um, so I said, well, I'd like you to talk about me. And he said, well, I think you need to go see the CEO about that. So I did. And I said, I, you know, I'd like to have conversations about my career and what I can do next. Anyway, shortly thereafter, I became an executive vice president. Shortly thereafter, the fellow that had been promoted went on to become the president of Starbucks. And shortly thereafter, I became co-president and went on to run the firm uh, for many years. And so it just goes to show that there's these moments of truth where you've got to put yourself out there, scary as it might seem, get prepared and then go do it. In terms of leadership style, I would say mine, um, I didn't know this at the time either. I don't know when this phrase was uh, was coined, but my, my style is very much a servant leader. Um, I don't know whether it's my time on... Uh, on sports teams, um, I was a volleyball player, a basketball player, ran relay in, in, uh, in high school, played uh, volleyball in college and basketball in law school. So always, you know, passing the ball and relying on somebody else in the, in the formative uh, years of my leadership. And then running four seasons, very global, highly decentralized, um, massively diversified, 35,000 employees who essentially were responsible for for great customer service every moment of the day. Control is not something that, that's easy to come by in that environment. Uh, I, I learned really early on the importance of influence and that influence would matter more than power and more than direction. And so that served me well um, through, uh, through my time at Four Seasons. And, and now as I serve as, as uh, in wonderful peer groups on boards and advisory boards around the world. So I'll leave it at that, Melanie. Great. Thanks so much. 
appreciate it. Um, Rondo, would you like to tackle that question next? Sure, and I'll touch on some of this at the very end as well. So I don't want to give it all away. But in in terms of uh, strategies, I would say my my two strategies have been um, the value of mentorship and sponsorship, and uh, then just the very act of stretching myself. And, and my mentors and sponsors have have created that environment. So I think uh, you know, especially for women in leadership, the the value of having somebody to coach and guide you and stretch you, you know, it's completely invaluable. Uh, I was really guided that uh, growth happens when you you take yourself just slightly out of your comfort zone and you keep doing that and you're kind of always living just a little bit stretched out of your comfort zone. And if you take yourself too far at once, you will fail. So that's been a guiding principle for my success and uh, just a lot of listening. In terms of style of leadership, I think the best way to, to understand that is to ask the people around you. So, so I did a little bit of that and, and people would describe me, even my family, that uh, you know I set high expectations for myself and and for others. Uh, and I'm a very action oriented leader. You know, I want to get in and help and influence. I'm disciplined, I'm organized, and I have a lot of compassion for people. So I think when those ingredients are mixed, you know, that's how I've been extremely successful, hardworking, disciplined, but set expectations that are high, but have a lot of compassion. Great. Thanks for that, Rhonda. Julie, I'm going to turn to you next on that question. Thank you. And again, uh, welcome to everybody. It's uh, great to have this conversation today. Um, I believe that fundamentally leaders have two roles to deliver results and to develop people. And so my first strategy for success has been to stand out by delivering results. Um, so having worked in sales, marketing and fundraising for most of my career, the metrics have been pretty clear, whether that's increasing revenue, market share or funds raised. And so I've set ambitious goals and done everything possible to exceed them. My second strategy for success has been to focus on developing people. And so building and motivating a team is a core leadership competency. So I pay a lot of attention to recruiting, inspiring, and supporting the success of the people on my team, uh, but also the people around me. Um, and so to that end, I describe my leadership style as enabling. Um, I believe that feeling safe and supported at work allows people to push boundaries, to experiment and fail, to be honest about their fears and to go above and beyond. And so I've always sought to be the leader that enables employees to grow and succeed, which is in the end how leaders deliver results. Great, thank you. Some common themes already. Uh, Dawn, would you like to speak? Absolutely. Thank you, Melanie. And I too want to say how honored I am to have the privilege to live, work, and play here um, in traditional territory as I'm in Chisagi and Anishinaabeg. And when we were first asked this question about how to describe our leadership style, I, I jokingly said, you know, chaos, um, if that could be described as a style. And, and I realized I was only half joking. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, I never intended to be a leader. I was the still on the youth council at the Native Women's Association. And it was during the year of the blackouts. And when I got to the meeting, I was a little late because of the blackout. And everybody was talking and, and the elders asked if I would let my name stand for president. And, and I thought, well, you know, like it'll be a good experience for the election because these are elected positions. And so when the meeting started and the elders nominated me for president and they asked if I would let my name stand. And I said, yeah, thinking this would be a good experience. I could learn a lot from this, you know, if I ever wanted to be president in the future. Um, then, but, you know, within indigenous community, if the elders have nominated somebody to be leader, nobody else would dare nominate anybody else. So when they asked for more nominations, you know, the, the room went silent and, and nobody else spoke up. And it was at that moment I realized, oh Lord, what have I done? And I, I felt, you know, completely unprepared. So, you know, the, this notion of pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and, you know, pushing yourself a little bit beyond, I think in Indigenous community, it's much more of a push you off the end of the dock kind of approach and you sink or swim. Um, but what I learned the most from that was, you know, and, and at each step going from, you know, president of a provincial association up to vice president of the national association, then eventually, you know, the, the president of the national association was to know who you can trust. And it was those elders who had faith in me. I mean, some might call them mentors, some might, but it was those elders who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. 
and pushed me into that role and kept pushing me into certain levels. And, and it was also those elders that when things got tough that I went back to and said, you know, I don't know if I can do this. You know, the night before we were supposed to have our first national indigenous organization meeting with the new prime minister Trudeau, and everybody was fighting about who gets to speak first. And I was almost in tears, not knowing what I was going to do. And the elders said, you know, we'll come down to the fire. And because I was in Ottawa and, and the only clothes I had was my fancy suit for the next day and my high heels. I literally went down there in my pajamas. So you can imagine me standing on the street corner of Ottawa in these pink cheetah print pajamas and high heels, because that was the only shoes I had with me as we go off to the fire. And we just sat by the fire. And, you know, those elders offered their tobacco and they said, you know, when you go there tomorrow, you follow your heart, you speak from the heart. And I think that was the most important thing was to know who you can trust. And it's not always the people who are the yes man the yes women who, who agree with you. Sometimes there's a lot of people who, who push back hard, but knowing those who I could trust to, to really give me an honest assessment of when I was doing things, you know, going the right path or going a wrong path. And I think that the number one tip I had was that we don't do things democratically. I mean, some people find that really hard to believe because like democracy is this vision of, of the highest you can achieve. And, and by that, I mean, democracy is this notion of the majority wins. We work by consensus, and that doesn't mean unanimous, which means everybody agrees. Consensus is we work until we come to something we can all agree with or at least not strongly oppose. And that means including making sure everybody has their voice heard. Even if that's ultimately not the way they go, everybody has to be heard. Everybody from you know, the woman at the front desk to our managers. And then we're all on the same team and feel that we're all part of this. And I think that was, that was a really big learning for me from my, my elders who taught me the importance of, of letting everybody be heard in the conversation. So, Great. Thank you. Thank you, Don, so much. I'm going to turn, uh, thanks to all of you for that. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay. And I was thinking about, you know, pushing boundaries and out of your comfort zone. You're a fourth year student. You've got lots of confidence. And now you get to go into that zone. So, Lindsay, over to you. Thank you, Melanie. And like everybody got a chance to say, I'm very honored to be here. Rose there briefly. So, am I good right now? Start with the first question. Okay, awesome. All right, so our first question What are some of the challenges you think women face in leadership roles? And is this different for women in occupations that have traditionally been male dominated? So, to start off, Rhonda, would you like to um, begin with this question? Sure, thank you for the question. And certainly I represent the manufacturing sector in Canada and that sector represents 10% of employment in Canada. So a lot of people, 1.8 million people work in this sector, but only 28% of them are women and only you know, 5% of women CEOs, 20% of women leaders. So women are, are grossly upper, underrepresented in this sector. And, you know, they really, um, myself and others have lacked opportunity for advancement. I think that's, you know, opportunity for advancement and gender pay gap in, in male dominated industries tend to be, you know, the, the top issues for women. And th those are things that, th that I'm fighting every day to, to break down. And, and we've made a lot of progress, frankly, in particular in my sector on gender pay gap. Uh, but opportunity, that's where sponsorship really comes into play. And, and I'm the beneficiary of, of sponsorship where, you know, and men play a big part in this as well to take women and make sure that they ha have equal opportunity or better opportunity even right now in a she session for advancement. So there's a role for men and women to play to make sure that there's a level playing field in terms of advancement in the sector. But I think the other side of that, you know, is that... Um, there's, for myself, later in my career, as a, one of the very few women leading and advancing, there was an advantage for me because I offered unique perspective. And so, you know, I get sought after all the time now as, as one of the few women leaders in the sector. So the opposite side of that is, you know, that there can be some, some great opportunities for you because you are a woman. Great. Thank you, Rhonda. Does anyone have any quick follow-ups to this question? I would agree with what uh, with what Rhonda said. There's uh, there's no question that uh, it's different for men and women in the workplace and in leadership roles. And of course, that difference gets even more magnified in in industries where women are not traditional uh, traditionally either employed or or more importantly seen as leaders. 
um, when I joined the hotel industry all those so, so, so many years ago, um, there were very few women in general management, um, very few women in the operation side of the business. And I was the only woman um, at everything I went to, whether it was a management meeting, a partner meeting, an, a senior employee meeting, um, I was uh, the only one there. And, and I, while I agree with a lot of uh, what R R Rhonda said mirrored my own, uh, my own experience um, that presented unique opportunities, I also learned um, uh, in, uh, in a session that we did for International Women's Day, believe it or not, I brought together all of the then women leaders. Um, uh, by this point, I'm in a leadership role at the company, and we actually have quite a number of women leaders. And I talked to them about the structural barriers to women in, in the business, our business in particular, but I think it applied across the industry. And, and one of the things always was, oh, well, this is a 365, you know, 24 seven kind of job beyond your control. You just can't do anything that, uh, that plan for anything because emergencies arise all the time. So I had this captive group of women and, and uh, my men, my men leaders had said that, you know, that was 75 to 90% of the work was just that unpredictable, unplannable, un unmanageable uh, for women in business. So I asked the women who had taken on these jobs, um, two questions, both of which had been answered differently by men. The first one was what percentage of the time uh, in your job is uh, dedicated to things over which you have absolutely no control and are total surprises. And the man's answer was 75 to 90 and the women's answer was 10%. Um, and so I thought it was a very interesting observation that there is a way to structure work differently um, if you need to for family reasons, for personal reasons, for whatever. And so it shouldn't just be oh, well, that's the way it was. We have to work on that's the way it ought to be, right? Um, and, uh, and the other thing I asked them about was whether or not these top jobs, these big jobs, could they be shared? Because one of the things that we were encountering was women needing to take time off for family, needing to take time off for child rearing and, and child bearing. And my senior man's answer was absolutely not. These are command and control jobs. They just need to be you know, captain deliberately. Um, not surprisingly, the women's answers were completely different. Um, no question this job could be shared. No question um, two women could figure out how to, uh, how to organize themselves uh, to run one of these big operations. And those are just big eye openers for me that we need to pay attention to the structure of work and, and how that impedes the progress of women um, in lots of different ways. Great, thank you, Katie. All right, we're gonna move on to our next question. All right, so community building seems to be a common theme amongst our panelists today. Can you please discuss why this has been important to you? And Dawn, could we start with you on this question? Absolutely, thank you. And, and you know, very much related to the previous question, you know, in our community, we often talk, it's not about the gender wage gap, it's about the mommy wage gap. And really that's about the fact that women are the center of our nations and women are the center of our communities. And we have found that, you know, across Ontario with the indigenous organizations, 80% are run by indigenous women. And part of that means, you know, if we are going to be having succession planning, if we are going to build our capacity in our communities, it's about thinking differently about being flexible. Yes. I, I know many Indigenous women, many women who, when they became pregnant, hid their pregnancies because it was seen as, oh, Lord, now she's done it. You know, you might as well just pack it in. We're not going to bother investing anymore in her future. But how do we be more flexible? Yes, she may have to leave at 3.30, but that doesn't, from as most women, as all women know, your day doesn't end at 3.30. If it means she comes back to work for a couple hours and finishes things off in the evening after the kids are in bed or, you know, like from four to 6 a.m. if that's the time she has quiet, being flexible, starting to think outside the box, as you said, for what works and, and how we can do that. Because this is really critical in our communities that after having had, you know, government take away capacity for centuries, we're really in a critical process of rebuilding capacity. And that means, building, investing in our people, investing in the people who are th within the organization, taking that active role, investing in them, rather than continually just looking outside for who we can pay for quickly to bring people in. But, you know, taking those people that you have faith in that, you know, and, and helping to build them. And that's really about having confidence in your people. 
Great, thank you so much, Don. Uh, did anyone else have any quick contribution to that question? I'd like to note when I came to uh, Peterborough in the late 90s to, uh, to join uh, Quaker Oats, I, I was still you know, very much involved in um, business in Toronto, uh, Chicago, you know, my previous jobs, you know, traveling to, uh, to head offices all around the world. And uh, when I came to uh, Peterborough um, and eventually moved into the role working in the hospital foundation, I started to realize that the, the reason that this community was so great and what it attracted me in the first place was people who were spending their time um, to invest their efforts and their vision in the community. And uh, so I was able to start to uh, contribute to my community, get involved uh, with these other volunteers and community leaders and be a part of something a lot greater. And, and that uh, you know, has benefited me and the jobs I've done in so many ways. Um, and I've discovered that really that some of the most rich experiences I've, I've had are, are those that have been involved in community building. And in fact, it was what really attracted me to the position at Trent was the opportunity to make Trent more consequential to the community to bring the community and Trent together. And so I really encourage people um, who are pursuing their, their careers and their journey in leadership to get involved in the community much earlier than I did. Yeah, you will really benefit and, and uh, get a lot from that. That's amazing. Thank you, Julie. All right, we're gonna head on to our next question. Are there a lot of questions that you have been asked in your career because you are a woman and that maybe men don't typically get asked? And we will turn to Katie for this one, if that's all right with her. Well, the answer, uh, Lindsay, is absolutely yes. Um, not surprisingly, um, given uh, my background being in a, a quite male-dominated, uh, male-dominated set of worlds, whether they be, uh, you know, law to begin with, hotels after that, and and finance and 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 corporate Canada. Um, lots of uh, lots of times I've been turned to for big and small questions. Um, you know, largely because I. I was a uh, I was a woman. In fact, I'm pretty proud of the fact that most of the opportunities I've had, um, particularly since I uh, since I left Four Seasons, have been on account of because I was a woman. Uh, right? The uh, the door opened because they uh, the folks thought they needed more inclusive uh, inclusive leadership style, more diversity, and uh, and so I was being, being able to bring that toolbox. Um, does does it irritate me? No. No, um, sometimes uh, people uh, people think, oh well, they're just using me as a uh, as a sounding board for the problems they haven't uh, they haven't yet figured out themselves. But I do think that that women are experts in many 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 things, and for us to be able to bring that special expertise and much the way Rhonda described earlier in in the in the hour um, to bear help people um, on their journey to learn more, find a way to create greater levels of sensitivity around all the issues we've been discussing, opportunities for women, sponsorship for women, uh, champion, championing women, you know, laying down our own political capital to advance women. It can be big things around women's careers. It can be small things about empathy uh, relating to, you know, whether it's uh, kids or pets or parents or the long list of things. Uh, the women are called upon to do. And sometimes it's nuances, right? It's, it's how to handle uh, situations. I had uh, lots of my male, uh, male direct reports and male colleagues had female direct reports and female colleagues. And, and, and sometimes they were at a bit of a loss for how to sensitively and, and effectively manage through um, a, a range of issues. And so if we can bring that expertise and think about um, the, uh, the way we work, the way we collaborate, the way we communicate, the way we build community. Uh, and we can bring all of those strengths to those answers and help people as, they're, as they're, they themselves are trying to muddle through some, some of these difficult issues. That, that can be a form of female superpower um, that organizations can uh, harness and, and apply. Um, it is important that that superpower not be overused, though. We, we can't be seen as the people who, who you know, make the coffee, clean the, uh, clean the, clean the conference rooms, um, uh, are always there for, if somebody needs a shoulder to cry on. We need to develop, you know, those little skills and those big skills in people around us so that we, we don't allow a dependency to come. Um, from us because of our, our unique perspectives and, and, uh, 
and uh, ways of being wired. But but having said that, um, turn it into a positive and make it make it a force for change. Great, thanks, Katie. That was very inspiring. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'd like to add a little bit uh, because I think there's an important discussion here in terms of questions that I know I and I think we get asked all the time that I don't think men are asked and that's on balance. So I think every panel I sit on, you know, one of the closing questions is how do you balance all of this as a woman? And, you know, I think if we're going to really shift the business paradigm, we have to shift the domestic paradigm and we're actively doing that. So, you know, I don't think men get asked those questions. You know, women get asked, did they stay home with their children? Did they take a maternity leave? Did men take a paternity leave? You know, we need to start to shift the conversation around the domestic paradigm if we're going to have success in the business paradigm. Absolutely. Thank you, Rhonda. All right, we're gonna to turn to Julie for our last question. One quick one before we turn to the audience. All right, so Julie, what is one piece of advice you would give to students who are about to graduate? So I thought a lot and I, I wrote down many different uh, answers here. So um, something maybe that, that uh, departs a bit from some of the conversation we've had. Um, I'd say it's really critical to develop the ability for self-reflection and self-awareness. Um, so being able to understand and analyze your feelings, actions, and responses is a really important leadership competency. And, and it's really critical to learning and, and growing as an individual, a leading yourself. Um, you know, why did I respond that way when I was challenged? How else might I have approached that decision? What's holding me back from taking the next step? I had the opportunity to participate in a very transformative experience uh, when I worked at Quaker and the big um, training philosophy at that time was called designing high performance organizations. And they put uh, cross functional groups of people together um, and literally locked us away for a week and they had us work through a series of exercises that uh, were disguised as a way to build teams and to um, norm and then storm and then reform. And uh, it forced forced me at that point and at that time I was a very ambitious uh, young marketer um, who was very very keen to move ahead much more quickly than my career path was learning and and what I was forced to realize was I, I, to be the leader I don't always have to speak first I don't have to be the loudest um, my opinion isn't always right and and part of that exercise literally forced me to speak last to only build on other people's points and not for my own. And uh, some of the greatest um, kudos I got after that was in the opportunity to, uh, to build a cross-functional team. Uh, I, I chose not to lead it. Uh, it was a team that required a lot of project management skills that, that weren't my best skills. And I invited a colleague to lead the team and that I would play a different role. And that was probably one of the most significant career experiences I had and, and the ability to continue to, to learn from yourself um, is I think very, very key and important and, and journal that and, and keep, keep notes and see how you're doing. Fantastic, thank you, Julie. All right, yes, Don. So actually um, I was thinking about this and what the best piece of advice I ever got in terms of balance um, was you have to think outside the box that just because this is the way we've always done things doesn't mean it's the best way. Doesn't even necessarily mean it's a good way. And, and there might be an easier or an easier way or a better way. And, and by this, I remember when I became pregnant with my first child, my grandmother, who was a source of great wisdom, who ran the school bus, ran the general store, the post office, and raised four kids in the era before diapers, said, are you going to be a white sock mom or a black sock mom? And I thought, the old lady's finally gone senile. I had no idea. And she said, no, think about this. She said, you know, when, when you hit that day, you see all these parenting columns that say, you know, my kids go to school and because they don't wear indoor shoes, their socks come home absolutely muddy on the bottom. How do I, you know, teach my child? And we get all this advice about, well, you know, you make your child do the laundry and, and they'll learn the extra work they're creating and, you know, all these different strategies. And my grandma says, or you buy them black socks and you get over it. And I thought this woman is brilliant. And she says, yeah, you know, that moment when you've had rice and the baby throws it all over the floor and you're trying to pick up these little sticky bits of rice. She says, or do you take the kids, you go for a walk. By the time that rice is dry, when you come back, you can sweep it up easy peasy. And I thought this woman is brilliant. Sometimes there's easier ways of doing things. And as women, we kind of hold ourselves to this notion of, I have to prove I can do this the same way when actually 
there might be an easier, smarter way. You just have to, you have to think outside the box. You have to think I can do things differently. Um, although apparently buying a puppy is the best thing for keeping the floors clean. Just like. Uh, Lynn, I think Lindsay just froze again, but we were at the, oh, did you want to say any last comment, Lindsay, and then I'll take over the the next piece? Thank you for everyone. All of your answers were so inspiring, and definitely as a student, it was really nice to hear from all of you, especially as women in leadership. So thank you for letting me participate. Off to you, Molly. We can do the Q&A now. Thanks, Lindsay. That was fantastic. You did a great job. Uh, and Rhonda, just to let you know, we really purposely did not want to ask a, how do you balance it all a question on this panel? Because I agree. I think it's, uh, that's the thing that frustrates me is the questions that, not the questions you do get asked, but the questions that men don't get asked. It really, that's my little pet peeve as well. So thank you for that answer too. All right. So we have a question here um, from Sheila. What is something that empowers you to continue to fulfill leadership roles uh, each day? So is there something that you, you feel like kind of on a daily level empowers you to take on a leadership role? And I don't have a particular person I have to start with there, but anyone want to jump in? I'll go first. I think the thing that uh, that's always been uh, been a driver for me has been the, uh, the, the desire to help people whether it's helping groups or helping companies or helping individuals, whether it's mentoring or serving on a board or leading a company, all of those things I think at their heart um, for me have been about how do you make the team better, right? Um, just about everything we do in life is a team sport, whether it's family, uh, business, community, actual sports. Um, uh, it, takes, uh, it takes a whole group of people and getting a team to be high performing and winning, um, I don't think there's there's uh, really a better uh, a better uh, source of joy for me than seeing a team that uh, that I've been working with or being a part of actually doing great things. Um, you come away and you're you're inspired by the uh, by the just the the sheer ability you have to collaborate and and connect. I'm a big, uh, I'm a capital E Myers-Briggs extrovert. So being with people, spending time with people, um, it also provides me energy. Um, so there is a, uh, there is a, a purpose to it, but at the end of the day, it's, it's also a, a mechanism by which I recharge my batteries and get ready to do it again. Yep. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Yeah. And I, and I would echo those sentiments. That's basically how it works for me. Uh, but I think the other thing is that, you know, in, in the areas I work, the work is far from done. And, you know, I am in a place of power right now. And so I have to intentionally um, use that power for the greater good. I can't afford to just stop, you know, there's purpose here and, and my passion and hard work is making a difference. So that fuels me every day to go out and keep beating on the drum and keep driving the success that's required. We need to keep moving the dial. Yeah, Don. I just wanted to add um, something that seems counterintuitive, but you know, again, some really great advice I got was sometimes when you're struggling, do you know when we're talking about equality, when we're talking about you know those gaps, and it's really easy to become paralyzed or become depressed by. The, slow, the, the slowness of the progress about how long it's taking us, about we're not making progress. And, and one of the things I was told that instead of always looking forward, you need to stop and look backwards. And I thought, well, that's kind of stupid. And they said, no, actually, you know, because we were always taught, right, you know, you've always got to look forward. You always got to keep planning. And they said, no, sometimes it's easy to lose track of how far you've come. If you don't stop and take a look back over your shoulder and see how far you've come, see how far you've achieved. Yes, there's lots to do still, but you can, when you, it's only when you look backwards, you can see how much far you've come and how much you've achieved. And, you know, that was what they say. You can only know where you're going if you know where you've come from. And, and that's really solid advice to stick with to, when you get those days where you just feel like there's, we're not making progress and there's too much. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can add an academic uh, theme to this uh, from, from my study of the, the masters in leadership that one of the key distinguishing uh, traits or, or elements of leadership is actually motivation to lead. 
Um, you have to have that uh, motivation in order to withstand all of the challenges because stepping into a leadership role brings with it scrutiny, challenge, lots of uh, issues and the ability to get through those days, those difficult moments, you have to have that motivation to lead. And so, you know, when you find that and Katie talked about trying to find that early on in your career, you need to hold and reform that and, and that will shape as you move through different stages of your life and different organizations and surround yourselves with, with touch points, whether it's pictures and images of, you know, a, a great day or who you're trying to, to help, but fueling that motivation to lead is absolutely an essential touch point for successful leaders. Great. Thanks, Julie. Uh, we have a few more minutes, not long, but we have a sort of a fun one, Lindsay, that uh, I'm going to turn that one over to you because it is it is a good it's a good question, actually, and people are sometimes surprised by the answers to this one. All right. So this one's from Joanne. I particularly enjoy this one because sometimes I totally feel like an introvert, but she basically asked, um, are any of you introverts? How did that affect your experience in advancement and leadership? So I would like to take this one if I could, because I started this journey, uh, maybe not an introvert, but extremely shy. And uh, my hus husband would attest to that, that even 15 years ago, I wouldn't get up on a platform and, and talk about our company at an award ceremony or anything. I didn't have the confidence to do it. You know, I I, uh, I had to learn those skills. And I think, you know, you aren't necessarily given those skills. And I actually uh, took some classes on imp improvisation and with Linda Cash, many of you would know her, to really learn how to get out of my head and into the room to use my voice. And, and, and also what I learned is when you can really have that purpose and passion and you can speak from there instead of trying to speak technically, that uh, your voice resonates and, and you can be heard. And so I try to speak about this a lot at Trent events and other, others. And I often have a lot of young women. I remember one in particular, a woman from China at a Trent event came up to me afterwards and said, you know, how shy she was. You know, I was a shy, nerdy math student, uh, had my head down in, in my books. And, uh, you know, today I'm a spokesperson for the sector internationally. So it, it again, it's that progression of stretching yourself, but uh, have courage, take risks and grow. Thank you, Rhonda. Yeah, I guess definitely pushing boundaries is a good way to get out of that introverted perspective. I, I would also say that, um, you know, there's fabulous leaders in the world who have been technical introverts and fabulous leaders who are technical extroverts. Um, that is not the defining element of great leadership, right? It, it really is um, something that is more about where your energy come from, comes from and how your energy is depleted. All of the, uh, all of the rest of leadership comes from practice. It's the, it's the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hour rule. And whether it's public speaking or relationship building or influence um, um, uh, practicing or whatever it is, um, no matter what type you are, all of those skills need to be practiced and practiced and practiced over and over and over again. And even when you reach 10,000 hours in some of the key leadership competencies, that's not enough because the world has changed. So, you know, I probably did my 10,000 hours on public speaking before the internet was invented. And then all of a sudden now I have to learn all kinds of new ways of communicating that are completely unrelated to the skill set um, I've been training for my whole career. And so this, uh, this leadership learning journey is unending. Um, and so, you know, you take your yourself and your energy source as you find it, and then you go out and acquire the leadership skills you need to build on your own personal strengths. Thank you, Katie. Awesome. Um, I think we're going to, oh, sorry, I'll let Dawn speak yeah. and then we're going to move into the portion. Just one really fast comment is, you know, something part of our traditional teachings, they talked about the difference between men and women's leadership. And, and it comes from, from those, our role as women that, you know, men might have this, this power. It's this sort of, you know, pound your fist on the table kind of power in a room where they take over and, and, you know, women have, women are the water carriers. We are given that life. We carry that water inside of us. And women have the power of water and it's a very different kind of power. It's a very different kind of strength. 
it's, you know that water can take on the shape of any vessel it goes into. It's you know, inherently flexible, but water also has tremendous power. That if you go to the shore of North, you know, North shores of Lake Superior, Lake Ontario, Lake Huron, and you see that granite, that women have that power of persistence, that water one drop at a time can wear away the hardest of rock, that granite that pit away the hardest of barriers with that persistence, one drop at a time. And those voices of women, that one drop of water, if you put those together, all of those voices coming together, we have that power of coming together. We've seen even in Peterborough, enough drops of water together, you know, took out all of downtown Peterborough, changed the entire physical landscape that we live in. And that's the power we have in terms of building community, in terms of coming together and each woman taking their one small piece, their one small voice, raising that voice until together we can change the entire landscape. And that's the difference in the kind of power we hold as water care. Thanks, Dawn. It's really, yeah, that's really beautiful. Uh, I'm going to thank all of you for your insightful answers. I know there were lots more questions and we are, we've run out of time, but uh, great conversation and really thoughtful. I would like to briefly turn us over now to Lee Hayes, Director of Alumni Engagement and Services um, for a special award presentation. So thanks everyone. And Lee, it, the floor is yours. Thank you, Melanie. Um, hello, everyone. Hello to all of our participants. Hello to our panelists. And thank you so much, panelists, for all of your time and wisdoms that you've shared with us so far today. Um, and thank you to the School of Business and Zosti College for your collaboration on this event. Um, I'm really privileged to be here today for a special award presentation to one of our panelists. And it is the Distinguished Alumni Award. And the Trent University Alumni Association's Distinguished Alumni Award is presented yearly um, based on a person's achievement and leadership in their field. Recipients will have shown leadership in business, industry, a profession, or in public life. They will have brought honor to Trent University through endeavors which have earned them prominence within their field. Their vision, commitment, creativity, and leadership will have been recognized within their field or beyond it. And uh, so about a year ago, the awards committee of the Alumni Association uh, made their decisions for their uh, award recipients for 2020. And I'm pleased to announce that uh, the Distinguished Alumni Award recipient is Trent alumna Rhonda Barnett, class of 87. Rhonda holds a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics. Now, as you would have heard uh, in Melanie's introduction, um, Rhonda is the President and Chief Operating Officer of Avit Manufacturing, and it's formerly known as Steelworks Design, which she co-founded with her husband, John. Rhonda's passionate and relentless promotion of small to medium-sized Canadian manufacturers has turned heads, and her recent appointment to the federal government's Industry Strategy Council is a testament to the widespread respect she has earned. You've learned a lot about Rhonda so far on this panel. And I'm hoping to tell you a little bit more um, about some of the wonderful reasons why she was selected for this award. She's a director with the local Kawartha Manufacturers Association with NGen, which is Next Generation Manufacturing Supercluster in Canada, and the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters Association, known as CME for short. That is Canada's oldest trade association. And Rhonda was national chair of the CME from 2016 to 2018, and the first woman in history to lead the 150 year old organization. And she currently sits as the immediate past chair for the association. In 2017, Rhonda launched CME's Women in Manufacturing Working Group, convened to elevate the participation and roles of women in Canadian manufacturing. And Rhonda has increased just achieved incredible, um, incredible strides and really moved the needle in this area through her work. This collective mobilized funding by the federal government with the goals of adding 100,000 women to the manufacturing workshop workforce, pardon me, over a five year period and granting awards in support of the education of young women entering manufacturing. 10 scholarships in the amount of $4,000 each were given out between 2018 and 2020. And I just wanted to share that some pre-pandemic statistics demonstrated that already 35,000 women were added to the sector in just 18 months. Because the recession eroded this progress, um, Rhonda is now working to double down on the efforts to bring women back to the sector 
and add 100,000 women over the next five years. Rhonda was also recently appointed as chair of the federal government's Advanced Manufacturing Economic Strategy Table. She's a very busy person. <laughs> Rhonda's been an active supporter of the Greater Peterborough Area Economic Development Corporation and the Greater Peterborough Chamber of Commerce, Startup Peterborough, the Greater Peterborough Innovation Cluster, and the Water Research and Innovation Network in Kawartha Lakes. She participates annually, although not last year because it didn't happen, in the local Dragon Boat Festival for breast cancer. She herself is a survivor and a role model and champion for other women battling the disease. She's also served on the board of Peterborough Singers with whom she's also performed. She's an international spokesperson on the manufacturing sector and she's traveled on the request of the Canadian government to countries including Mexico, the Netherlands, China, Germany and Italy, including speaking at the World Manufacturing Forum. She's a regular guest speaker or moderator for events focused on STEM and women in business and leadership. This includes panels at Trent University, such as today. Speaking of Trent, Rhonda has stayed closely connected to the university, not just as a guest speaker and panel member, but as an active volunteer with the alumni mentoring program. And she's also a Trent mom with her daughter, Emily, um, also a recent Trent graduate. Woohoo, Emily. Her staunch commitment to the betterment of her community and her tireless volunteer work led to a 2017 induction into the Junior Achievement Business Hall of Fame. In 2019, she was recognized with an Inspire Women's Award and selected as one of 50 amazing Canadian women in STEM who empower, inspire, uplift, and support those around them. In her nomination, she was described as inspirational, passionate, and strategic. For her demonstrated leadership and accomplishment within the business sector, for her leadership of women and for volunteerism and giving back to the communities in which she lives and works, the Trent University Alumni Association is pleased to present Rhonda Barnett with the Trent University Alumni Association's Distinguished Alumni Award. So I would encourage everyone to give Rhonda a huge hooray. Rhonda's holding up her award. Woohoo! <laughs> Please join me in congratulating Rhonda. Woo. And now Rhonda, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Thank you, Lee. I was talking to my husband last night and he said, are you preparing yourself to get emotional? And I said, I won't get emotional. This is Zoom. I'll be in my own office. I'm not standing in front of people, but wow, Don was right and he's listening. Ah, well, thank you so much to Lee, to the Trent University Alumni Association for recognizing my contributions. I'm truly honored and humbled to stand before you today on Zoom and receive this award. It's a, it's a lifetime achievement for me. And really my story and my message to you uh, is about ordinary people getting to do extraordinary things and hoping to inspire other people to do that. So. Uh, I should do some thank yous first. I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't thank my own family for their support because you don't do the kind of work I have done without tremendous support. Uh, I've had support from uh, my parents, from my sister, my husband and my daughters. They've been very strong advocates for me. I do a lot of traveling as you've heard and I spend a lot of long days in, in the work that I do and can be very distracted from family obligations. So uh, I've been very fortunate for their support, not only in supporting the work, but you know, coming along with me and participating in the things that I do. Uh, almost every one of my family members has traveled with me somewhere and, and got to see firsthand the work that I do and, and be connected to that. So my story really, and I've shared a little bit of it, but uh, 31 years ago, I guess I graduated. Uh, up on the steps of the, the library, the Battle Library. Uh, and I don't think anybody, certainly I didn't think, but I don't think anybody thought I was the poster child graduating there to have a future award um, presentation like this today. Uh, I was raised in a working class family. I was the very first to attend university and really nobody in, in my family understood how to do that or how to support me, but they did it in the ways that they could. Uh, I worked two and three jobs at a time to support the, the cost of going to university and my parents supported me as, as much as they could as well. Uh, I didn't understand about 
loans and things like that. Uh, so I did have the benefit of getting through without loans, but I, I did have to work a lot of hours alongside my studies to, to make this affordable. Uh, my parents played a vital role in my success. My mother herself was uh, a strong community philanthropist and she installed instilled that in me that, you know, it was imperative to always be looking at your community and seeing ways that you can give back, that it didn't matter how much or how little you had, you always had something for your community. And my father gave me my first job at the IGA in Peterborough that uh, was in East City. It's uh, now Foodland, I think. And I worked in, in the meat department since I was uh, 12 or 13 years old and, and through university. So he taught me the value of, of hard work and the commitment to your work that you needed to show up every day and step forward and, and do what you're asked to do. So I really thank my parents for instilling those values in, into me. So, you know, I, you could see that I never imagined myself here today. But uh, for me, it was really the hard work, as I spoke about today, the purpose and passion that I feel, I think they were the key drivers of my success and continue to be. Uh, I had opportunities presented to me and I, I sought out others. So the door isn't always open for you, but stand in front of it until it opens or crack it if you need to crack it and uh, find your way forward. And it's not a straight line. It wasn't a straight line for me. Uh, in, in closing remarks, I just say that, you know, my work is not finished. It's not finished at all. So we're in the middle of a she session and I am privileged to be at the table talking about that to our government and to corporate leaders. Uh, and on the plus side, we're in a manufacturing renaissance where we're looking at things like domestic supply and reshoring of critical products back to our country. So I have a lot of work to do. Uh, but within that work, I want to make sure that I take everything that I do with a gender lens. You know, I want to look at skills transformation and tech adoption, uh, and I especially want to bring women back to work in the work that I do. I want to push for equality and within the rebuilding of our equ economy. We talk about building back better, and that's what I believe in. It makes sense socially and economically. That's the work that I fight for every day. That's my purpose and passion. That's what I get up to do every day. On March 8th, it's International Women's Day, and the theme this year is Choose to Challenge. What does that mean? It means that the work's not done on breaking down barriers. We need men and women to call out discrimination and build equality for women and visible minorities in society and in the economy. Again, that's the work that I fight for every day. That's my purpose. That's my passion. We need to continue to move the dial for women in STEM and leadership. As I mentioned, only 5% of CEOs in my sector, only 20% of leaders and 20% of STEM. There's so much work to be done there because we need women at the table. They need to be better represented so we have better outcomes, better economic and social outcomes. My values are supporting mentorship and sponsorship. I want to push status quo every day and aim for higher and better. Most people know my motto is, if you can see me, you can be me. So today, I hope that my story inspires other women to achieve great things. Ordinary people do do great things. I want to refer to uh, one of the role models that uh, represents my campaign for women in manufacturing, and that's Rosie the Riveter. She had the slogan, we can do it. I continue to say that around uh, bringing more women into the sector. So we can do it. We will do it. Let's go do it. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, so inspiring. How great to talk about women in leadership and then finish with that inspirational leadership uh, talk. Thank you. That was amazing. Made me wish I was like 22 and ready for a new uh, a new career path, actually. But uh, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. And congratulations. You had a lot of congratulations in uh, both the chats that were going. So you can like browse through all the lovely comments there. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, I want to thank our panel deeply for being here today. Uh, Julie and Dawn and Katie and Rhonda, really inspiring. And thank you, Lindsay, for guiding us through that. Um, it was a great experience and great to listen to all of you. I am briefly now going to turn this over to Dr. Byron Liu, Director of the School of Business, um, to say a few closing remarks for us. Oh, you're on mute still there. Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> Thank you, panelists and moderators. On behalf of the School of Business, Soski College, Career Space, Life After Trent, and Trent University, 
I would like to thank Katie Taylor for her visit with us as the Trent School of Business inaugural CEO in residence. She has provided us with something of great value, her time, and has used it to share her knowledge and experience with all of us. She did this in several different settings, in public lectures, in several classes, in this panel, and later today and tomorrow, she is holding virtual office hours for mentorship sessions with students. While times were unusual this year, we made it into an opportunity to reach a larger audience. And of course, someone in Katie's position is always prepared to adapt to change and lead. And she continued completely unfazed, often taking the lead herself to guide us through it. We hope she can visit campus in the fall, perhaps for a Durham event linked with the opening of the new building. To honor Katie's visit, the School of Business will award two student bursaries of $500 each, one to a Durham student and one to a Peterborough student. Thank you, Katie, for setting such a great example and for setting the bar so high for the CEO and residence program going forward. Finally, a hearty thank you to everyone, too many to list who helped organize her visit and a call out to Deb Earl. It was her idea to organize this panel. So thank you very much, Katie. And back to you, Melanie, for upcoming events. Thanks, I'll just turn that briefly to Katie because like, I can see you on the screen there, Katie. <laughs> well, now you've caught me a little emotionally off guard. I had no idea you were gonna say all those things, Byron. So I'm feeling like Rhonda at the moment. But let me just say uh, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was uh, uh, something I'd never done before. And uh, despite the pandemic, I really do feel like I've had a wonderful engagement with, uh, with Trent, with the students at Trent um, and, uh, and Trent Durham. And I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing that um, in the years ahead. It was a, it was a great, great pleasure. Um, and as I said, I'll, I'll try to keep in touch in lots of ways. And if we can do something in person at Trent Durham next year, all the better. So thanks so much. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the sessions with the students today and tomorrow. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Katie. Uh, thanks everyone again, uh, Julie and Dawn. It was so great to have you with our with our panel and to have the leadership within Trent, beyond Trent, all the all the places. So thank you for that. Thanks everyone uh, for being with us today. I would just direct you to the fact that this was also a partnership with Career Space and Life After Trent because we of course want to help all students um, thinking about their futures as well. And I know all of you will. I know all of you would open yourselves up to mentorship student reached out. So I'm just throwing that out there and you can connect with us with Career Space, with, with the Life After Trent team, with Zosky College, with any of the colleges and the School of Business. So uh, on behalf of all of us, thanks so much everyone for joining us uh, and we appreciate everyone's time and we're at the end of our session.